hope everyone's doing well. We are uh, headed back home to Pennsylvania from picking up our 48-foot trailer this morning up in Connecticut at the place that does the uh, work on it. What you see in front of you is the boost gauge, and we're running 20-plus PSI, almost 30 pounds of boost, heading up a pretty moderate hill, which should give you an indication of how hard the engine's working. And we're in that part of western New Jersey, heading into northeastern Pennsylvania, where it, it gets it gets pretty steep and hilly. Um, and now we're about to head down a hill, and you'll see what happens next. Uh, that first graph on the top there, where it says 27%, that's the exhaust brake. Uh, which we've discussed in the past, but it's doing a really good job, actually, of controlling our speed, our speed headed downhill. And now we're at the bottom of a hill, headed back up. And the boost picks up because the truck is uh, having to accelerate itself up a hill. The cruise control is set at 65 and the engine and the transmission working together with that exhaust brake are doing a very, very good job of maintaining our speed. Our total weight is 24,500. Uh, and we actually mangled it the last time we talked about it. It's 12.5 uh, on the truck's drive and steer axles and another 12,000 on the trailer's axles. Uh, the trailer's total weight, though, is 16,000. And so it's got 4,000 on its... Uh, 4,000 on the hitch, which is adding to the weight of the pickup truck and bringing it from 8,700 up to about 12.5, and then another 12,000 pounds on the trailer axles. So a 16,000 pound trailer hitched up to an 8,700 pound truck. Again, you can, you can see from those gauges, the, uh, the exhaust brake, which is that top bar graph, slowing it down, and then the bottom graph, which is the boost gauge, doing the work to help the truck get up the hills. And so at a total loaded weight of 24,500, this truck is having absolutely no trouble getting up and down some hills that would be very, very challenging to other trucks. Um, our 2011 Duramax with this same trailer uh, was starting to struggle. And we've discussed it uh, in the past. It's only got 397 horsepower, 765 pound-feet of torque, which sounds like a lot. But believe it or not, uh, these hills put that engine to the test. And the six-speed Allison transmission that it's hooked up to, the Allison 1000, which in so many ways is a legendary transmission. And yet, believe it or not, a 10-speed. Uh, with those close ratios, uh, in the upper four gears, 7th, 8th, 9th, and 10th, uh, keep, the, uh, keep the engine right where it wants to be. Um, in that power band, and in some engines it's very, very narrow. In our Duramax, the engine's only really happy between about 1750 and maybe 2000 or 2100. Um, and so that's a, that's a very narrow power band where it's actually happy. And if the transmission's gears are spaced too wide, then you're forcing the engine either to lug itself at a very, very low speed um, or to rev itself uh, out at a at a very very high rpm like the like again that allison between fourth and fifth gear uh it's a it's like a chasm it's a huge gap in terms of the ratio um and then from fifth and sixth it's a lot closer uh and so from the one to one which in the six speed is fourth gear to the overdrive and then the double overdrive um that's pretty much all you've got just three just three gears to choose from. Whereas in this transmission, the one-to-one -one in a 10-speed automatic, uh, at least in the case of the Ford uh, heavy and light duty 10-speed, the one-to-one, -one, the direct drive is seventh gear, and so you have three overdrives to pick from, eighth, ninth, and tenth. And so it makes it, it just makes the engine uh, a lot happier because you've got a lot tighter spacing and uh, and you're not faced with that choice of either lugging the engine or revving the hell out of it uh, when you're pulling uphill under a lot of load. 
Uh, and so this transmission and this engine working together uh, make very, very uh, easy work of these hills. Very, very impressive. Uh, our fuel mileage, you can't see it on the dashboard, but it's about 11 and a half thus far, uh, which is which is not bad at all uh, for, for this much weight. 11 and a half miles to the gallon are not bad at all. By way of comparison, our power boost, which we actually traded in when we got this truck, the F-350, our power boost typically got six to eight miles to the gallon, or maybe on a good day, 10 or 12 miles to the gallon with a trailer with only a little 12 foot enclosed cargo trailer. This thing here is getting, again, 11 and a half miles to the gallon so we got 48 foot trailer with the trailer loaded to 16,000 pounds and the truck and trailer combined at about 24.5. So very, very impressive. And uh, the fact that the engine and transmission are working so well together and demanding so little intervention by the driver means the driver can pay attention to other things like staying safe, like staying in, in the lane, like watching traffic, like looking out for hazards up ahead. Uh, and, uh, and watching the blind spots in case you have to change lanes all of a sudden, things like that. And so it's just, it's just a real pleasure. Um, we're gonna slow it down a little bit. We're gonna bring it down to 60. We're headed in towards something called the Delaware Water Gap. And it gets a little bit, uh, not treacherous. The, uh, the road gets kind of narrow. It starts to twist and turn a lot. Um, and so again, The exhaust brake sort of cuts in and out depending uh, uh, what's needed. Generally speaking, it prefers to... Half mile. Take exit 4ABC toward US Sorry. 46 East, Columbia. Take exit 4ABC toward US 46 East, Columbia. Generally speaking, it tries to maintain the speed that it's going. Um, especially when you've got the cruise control set. Uh, it does not like to help you slow down. Um, especially on flat ground, on level ground. Uh, for example, when you're trying to slow down in preparation to get off the highway. Like when you've got an off-ramp coming up. It's not going to really help you slow down uh, and get your speed down so you can take an off-ramp safely. Um, especially on level ground. What it's going to do, for the most part, is help you go down long, steep hills safely. And that's not nothing. But it's also not uh, what our Duramax used to do for us, our 6.6 Duramax, uh, which pretty much as soon as you let off the throttle, even if you were on level ground, it would immediately kick in and start aggressively trying to slow you down. And that was a lot more helpful in a lot more situations. This thing, for what it's worth though, it does help you maintain a steady speed headed downhill. Um, and that is not nothing. If it needs to downshift in order to do that, it certainly will. Um, and again, if you've got the cruise control set, it will do everything in its power uh, to help keep the truck uh, at that speed, both going uphill and going downhill. So it does a good job. It's just not as good at that at that one critical task um, as some of the other trucks we've driven, specifically that 6.6 Duramax and what everyone keeps saying over and over and over again about the 6.7 Cummins. Um, again, if you watch a channel called PD Diesel with a guy named Paul, who's got a fleet of trucks, and I think they do hot shot trucking, um, he cannot say enough good things about that exhaust brake on the Cummins. Um, and he's got trucks that go 200,000 miles before they need to change their brake pads. Not their rotors, but just their brake pads. Um, because the engine and the exhaust brake are doing most of the braking. And that's a huge, huge deal. Whether or not you're ever going over mountains, even if all you're doing is driving on flat ground, like out in the Midwest, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, places like that, uh, the exhaust brake provides a huge safety factor for you. Unless the driver, who has a very limited attention span, 
pay attention to other things, like watching out for traffic, like watching those blind spots, like checking other gauges. It's a very scenic part of the country. And so it's flashing. Again, it says use caution the next two miles. Uh, they want you to slow down to 50 up ahead here. Because again, it gets pretty treacherous. And so we'll see what it does here. We've got the exhaust brake in uh, normal mode. It also has an automatic mode. And from our brief interactions with it, uh, automatic mode is even less inclined to intervene on your behalf than manual mode or normal mode. All right, checking the other gauges briefly. Notice your temperatures. The coolant is at 190. The oil, the engine oil is at 204 and the transmission's at 204. You, uh, it tends to be the case that the transmission and the oil temp are about the same, which leads us to believe, and we'll have to do some digging, but it leads us to believe that the, uh, that the transmission cooler is a liquid to liquid heat exchanger, not between the transmission and the engine coolant, but between the transmission and the engine oil. And it's a little bit unusual because the, the, the conventional way to cool your transmission off is with a, basically a radiator that you sandwich on top of the engine radiator and that you sandwich on top of the intercooler and you create this like stack of air to liquid coolers. But not in this truck. This truck doesn't even have an air to air intercooler as we understand it. The intercooler that ch cools down the charge air coming out of the turbo is a air to liquid intercooler, which can be more efficient. We'll have to do some digging to figure that out. Actually, uh, a few other things we need to check into. Somebody mentioned that the high output power stroke, which we've, which we've not necessarily ragged on, but we've said on a number of occasions that we see no need for it and it seems kind of egregious and it seems like an ego trip on the part of Ford because they wanted to be the first OEM to hit 500 horsepower um, and 1,200 feet, foot, pound feet of torque. Uh, the, in, the, uh, that engine, the high output power stroke, uh, as this other gentleman explained, he thinks it's got the ninth injector, meaning the, uh, or what some people call the hydrocarbon injector. It's the Delaware River down there. Uh, the hydrocarbon injector is uh, separate and it puts the fuel into the exhaust system at or even after the, uh, the turbocharger. It would almost definitely be after the turbocharger. And the standard output power stroke does not. The standard output power stroke uses like cylinder number eight. Uh, <clears throat> Uses cylinder number eight to inject the extra fuel. The extra fuel that you need to uh, light off that uh, the DOC, the diesel oxidation catalyst, to uh, execute a regen. And we're not sure if that's actually the case, or uh, uh, we're not sure if the the standard output has that or not. The high output definitely does. And we'll find out. We'll do some digging. Sniff around, figure it out. Um, so again, fuel mileage wise, this thing is very impressive, unloaded uh, on the way out to Connecticut this morning. And we left at like 6 a.m. It, it got 20 miles to the gallon on a 150 mile trip going between 65 and 75. And that's like the third time We've done a mileage test uh, and had this thing come up at 20 plus miles to the gallon. Not on really, really steep terrain, um, on relatively mild in terms of gently rolling hills, but 20 miles to the gallon at between 65 and 75 miles to the gallon, uh, unloaded, no trailer, no, no cargo. That's not bad for an 8,700 pound truck. 
with the aerodynamics that this thing has. A couple other things to pass along. Uh, the uh, in terms of the uh, the camera views, we did not get the external camera that uh, that attaches to the back of your trailer. Instead, we got the trailer TPMS, which seemed a little bit more critical to us. Um, and when you put the truck into reverse, uh, the first camera that comes up is the camera on the tailgate. Now we also didn't get the second, you know, the, the, the additional camera that's like on the top of the tailgate that when you drop the tailgate, it gives you a view behind the truck. Um, so you can back up with the tailgate down easily. And so as a result, when the tailgate's down and like, for instance, you're backing up to your trailer to hitch it up, your gooseneck, um, the default view that comes up is the, the, the camera in your tailgate that's facing down into the dirt. And, and then you get that beeping, that, 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 that sensor, the backup sensor that's beeping constantly, which is annoying the hell out of you. And you have to go in there and start messing around and pushing buttons and come up with the, uh, Uh, the, the camera that is, uh, well, in our, in our case, we have to find the camera that is in the, uh, at the back of the cab facing down into the bed to help us back up and line up the, uh, the ball of the hitch with the gooseneck trailer. And, and you have to manually do that. And then maybe you put it in park and, and then you put it back into reverse and the default camera, once again, that comes up is that camera in your tailgate that's facing down into the dirt. Um, and you have to get in there once again and start fiddling with the controls and find the camera that's in the back of your cab facing down into your bed. And it's just sort of annoying that it does that over and over and it doesn't stop and think to itself, hey, the tailgate's down. That camera in the tailgate is useless. Um, why don't we select the previous, uh, the last camera that was manually selected? which was the camera in the bed at the top of the uh, uh, the rear window. Or just do that in the first place. Um, and so that's a little bit annoying, a minor, minor irritation. But Ford generally is all over that kind of thing and they tend to handle those type of details. And, uh, and that's one detail they missed. Um, obviously the ultimate solution would be to have the camera the second camera in the tailgate that works when the tailgate's down, but we didn't get that with this truck. We also didn't get uh, another option, which might have been nice, uh, which was the scales um, that tell you how much freight you're loading into the bed and if you're starting to get over the limit. And we also didn't get that feature where it will automatically back itself up uh, to where it'll position the ball of the hitch precisely under the gooseneck. And that would have been nice as well, but you know, you can't have it all. Um, one thing we did order that we didn't get was the, uh, the max recline seats. We call them the max recline rear seats. No, they're the max recline front seats. And we ordered those, they didn't come with the truck and we can live without those because as we mentioned previously, we were not planning to make a practice of camping in the, uh, the front seat of this thing. It doesn't seem like a comfortable place to uh, to sleep for long periods. And the seats, as uh, you know, such as they are, they go way back, like way, way back, 70 plus degrees, I'm going to say, in terms of how far they recline. So uh, other observations. Um, oh, the squat. We measured it when we hitched up this morning at the trailer place. And uh, it squats about three inches. So the top of the uh, fender openings, the rear fender openings was at like 42. And once we loaded it up with 4,000 pounds of hitch weight, it squatted down to 39. And that's actually not that bad. Uh, it, it sort of seemed like it was a lot more than it was. It, it, it seemed like it was squatting five or six inches. But in reality, no, it was only squatting three inches under 4,000 pounds of hitch weight. And that's not bad. Um, uh, other observations, um, not really any, uh, oh yeah, the, uh, the, the exhaust filter, the DPF was at 70% when we hitched up in Connecticut at nine or nine thirty, 
and then we switched views. We put it on the uh, the tripodometer and and kind of set that up to do a mileage test for the return trip to Pennsylvania. And then the next time we flipped it over into this view, which was not long afterward, the DPF was down to zero. So we can only conclude from that that the truck did an active regen, an automatic regen, and just didn't tell us. It never tells us what it's doing in that regard. Um, and it's not super annoying. It just, it would be kind of nice if it told us that, so you'd at least know what's going on. Um, and not sit there wondering, but that's fine. The, the regens are, are non-intrusive. We've never had a regen happen uh, when we were not on the highway. We've never had a regen happen to our knowledge when we were cruising around the city and the truck has never given us that, that message that our Duramax gives us frequently that says uh, cleaning exhaust filter, continue to drive or words to that effect. It's never done that. Um, We also topped off the DEF, the uh, diesel exhaust fluid, before we got on the road. And so it was at 100%, um, well, about two, three hours ago. And it's burned about 2% since that time, because now it's down to 98. Another observation, when the uh, when the exhaust brake is, is going and it's kicking in, you'll also notice that the boost gauge goes up. And the reason for that is that the exhaust brake does its thing by clamping down the vanes in the turbo and restricting the flow of exhaust and creating a huge amount of back pressure and basically choking off the engine. Um, but in the course of making that back pressure, uh, by clamping down the vanes, it's also uh, spinning that turbine way, way up and making a huge amount of boost. And uh, in the course of making a huge amount, amount of boost, it's pumping lots and lots of air into the engine. And so it's so it's kind of doing a couple things at the same time. Um, and people don't tend to associate like massive amounts of boost with an exhaust brake because you, you associate boost with making lots of power. But in this case, uh, it has to make boost in order for the exhaust uh, brake to work. So uh, other than that, not much else to say. Uh, the truck is just doing its thing and uh, uh, creating very little drama and making our lives very, very easy. The uh, the lane centering system, otherwise known as self-driving or you know, a, a primitive version of Tesla Autopilot, which keeps you in the lanes, keeps you centered in the lanes, that does not work when you've got a trailer hitched up and plugged in. And Ford has their reasons for doing it. We've discussed it in the past. We think it's a monumentally uh, boneheaded decision on their part. They're, they're, they're scared of lawsuits. And in, in, the, in the course of disabling lane centering, they're actually making the truck less safe and more prone to have accidents. Because again, it's one more thing the driver has to do. Uh, keep this truck centered in the lane every second of every minute that the driver is driving. Um, and so one of the most critical safety features, safety innovations in the last 20 years, really the last 40 years, other than maybe airbags, anti-lock brakes, and stability control, uh, lane centering does not work when you need it most, which is when you have a big heavy trailer hitched up and you're trying to do a lot of things at once and your attention span is uh, very, very heavily taxed. Uh, one final observation to pass along. We have not had to mess with the plus and minus buttons. We have not had to lock out upper gears. Um, although... The transmission is somewhat re reluctant to downshift out of twenth, out of tenth gear, and there are occasions that we've observed where maybe it should have stayed and maybe it should have downshifted sooner. But it takes its sweet time deciding to downshift. You know, the boost will be up at 20 psi. The turbo's working hard. The uh, the driver and the uh, and the PCM or ECM are demanding lots and lots of power from the engine. And under heavy boost, you don't want the engine to be down at like 12, 13, 1400 RPMs. Um, because the engine is making lots of boost uh, for a reason. And the reason is that it needs lots of power. And you don't want to be like way, way down in the RPMs when you're under heavy boost. 
because that unnecessarily uh, increases your cylinder pressure. Uh, the engine at lower RPMs has to make a lot more torque, meaning cylinder pressure, uh, than it does at higher RPMs in order to make the same amount of power. And so we just wish, you know, this isn't half as bad as our diesel F-150, which was like on a suicide mission to avoid downshifting. Uh, and uh, and that truck was, was ridiculous and, and you had to force it over and over again to downshift. Uh, and it like resisted uh, to the strenuously the idea that it should downshift. And it really wanted to drive up a hill at 1200 RPMs with like 25 PSI of boost going through it in top gear with a with a large heavy trailer, relatively speaking, hitched up to it, going up a steep hill. And that was just monumentally stupid. This truck is not stupid like that. But again, in a case like this, we're going uphill. The boost is like 16 or 18 uh, PSI. And the transmission's in 10th uh, gear. And we're not, we're not, we're not like hard on the gas here. But, you know, in terms of longevity, you know, you want your piston rings, you want your head gaskets to last a quarter million miles or a half million miles. It doesn't promote longevity on the part of the engine uh, for the transmission to sit there stuck in 10th gear when you're going uphill at low RPMs uh, under heavy boost. And we just wish this, you know, it's, it's not that bad with this engine. But it's also, it, we just noticed it on a couple of occasions and thought, you know what? It really should have downshifted a while ago. Um, it helps having a 355 as opposed to like a 342 or a 331 uh, final drive. Because that, that, that works in your favor. That gives you more leverage, essentially. Um, and it means the engine isn't working quite as hard. Uh, as as an as as an engine would have to work if the final drive was taller, meaning the number was lower. Um, but just something we'll pass along. Uh, other than that, I uh, really nothing. Oh yeah, one more thing. You see our miles to empty uh, readout there. It says three twenty four. We noticed as soon as we plugged in the the uh, as soon as we hitched up and plugged in the uh, the harness meaning the trailer's uh, cable, that miles to empty reading, it changed overnight. It changed instantly from what it said when uh, the trailer was unplugged, which was like 650 or so. And the truck having memorized this trailer and remembering the gas mileage, the fuel mileage it was getting the last time this trailer was plugged in, it said, okay, here's your new calculation based on the fact that, well, now I know you've got a 48-foot trailer hitched up. And we actually selected it as the active trailer from our list of trailers. Um, it said, okay, well, based on your expected MPGs, here is your new miles to empty, your new distance to empty. And so that's kind of neat. Uh, that's very neat. Um, so there's not much else to pass along. Um, uh, the truck's doing a great job. We have had no need, as stated, no need to either lock out the upper gears uh, and absolutely no need to put it in a manual mode. Um, there's a guy named uh, PD Diesel. We, we talked about him earlier. Uh, he was pulling, uh, he was loaded up to 32,000 with his power stroke, which I think is a single wheel, single an SRW, not a dually. And he had that thing loaded up to 32,000. He's pulling containers with it. And he felt the need to put it into manual mode, manual mode going up and down hills, um, which you would expect would be the case when you're that heavy. Um, and in manual mode, he says, uh, the truck will uh, avoid at all costs downshifting or upshifting. Um, not to the point of being unsafe. You know, when the RPMs drop enough, low enough, you have to downshift. Um, and so it's a manual mode that works very well. Uh, we do notice our Duramax when you put it into manual mode. Um, yes, it will not upshift. 
and that's helpful at times. But it's also a lot more, uh, it's also a lot more inclined to downshift. Uh, not when the RPMs get dangerously low, but just when they get, you know, low enough that, low enough that it makes sense to downshift. And so in that sense, the, 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 the six-speed Allison is not really a true manual mode. It's more like the 10-speed Ford when you lock out the upper gears. So, so like you, so again, on the Duramax, you put the, the six-speed Allison in a manual mode, uh, in fourth gear. It's not going to upshift beyond fourth gear, but it's also going to be more than happy to downshift into third, second, and first if it feels the need to. This truck, apparently, when it's in manual mode, uh, no, uh, it will try as hard as it possibly can not to downshift until it becomes uh, impossible not to downshift. So we'll do we'll do one last uh, uh, demonstration here of the of the boost that this thing gives you going up steep hills, and then the exhaust brake going down steep hills. We're going through a place called Wind Gap, Pennsylvania. We're headed south on uh, Highway 33 towards like Bethlehem area, and Wind Gap is uh, it's like the northern edge of the Lehigh Valley. You go through Wind Gap headed north and then you're basically in the Poconos and then you come south through Wind Gap on 33 and you're coming into the Lehigh Valley and so what you'll notice and you can't really see the gauges too well we are well over 20 PSI in terms of boost the transmission is down in 8th gear and uh and the engine's at like 1,800, maybe 2,000 RPM, which is fine, which is exact, exactly where you want to be. We're going to slow it down a little more, down to 51, just because the road's kind of narrow, and, and, and it's got a lot of twists and turns. We'll set it at 50, even. And so now we're starting to go uphill. Again, a little bit steeper. The boost is climbing, transmission downshifts, boost climbs farther, okay and that's easy enough, headed uphill, nothing wrong with that. And now that we've crested and we're starting to head downhill, watch what happens. That exhaust brake's working hard for us. The engine downshifts. And then it upshifts because it thinks, well, maybe I didn't need to be uh, slowing it down so much. But then it downshifts again. And that exhaust brake is kind of going on and off and on and off. Um, It's, it's adjusting itself pretty const, pretty uh, uh, on a constant basis. You know, clamping and unclamping the vanes on the turbo and asking the transmission to shift up or down depending on how hard it needs to work to keep the, uh, the speed where it needs to keep it. So it does, again, like, the, the, we got no complaints about this powertrain when it's at highway speeds or even slower going up and down steep hills. Our issue with this powertrain is the fact that when you're on level ground and you come off the throttle and you start to get on the brakes, there are a large number of occasions where it's just basically sitting there watching and not really intervening to help you slow down. And that's our issue with it. Um, but we're not going to harp on it over and over and over again. It, it, you know, It is what it is. Uh, all in all, uh, and, and we're and we're we're getting close to home. This truck has done an excellent, excellent job uh, pulling this pulling this forty eight foot trailer that's decently heavy, not not super heavy, but decently heavy. Um, 
through pretty congested highways. And we've hit, and we've hit quite a bit of traffic, stop and go traffic. Uh, and the truck just doesn't mind. The truck speeds up, slows down. Um, it doesn't start to overheat. Doesn't have any issues like that. You, you wouldn't imagine that it would. Um, and as we, as we might've mentioned before, uh, we don't love digital dashboards, but this one is far from the worst. And it's got a lot of useful information that it presents to you in a pretty uh, user-friendly format. The only gauge that it doesn't have that we would like to see is your EGT gauge, your exhaust gas temperature gauge. Um, and again, your uh, the steering on this thing is is phenomenal. It is it is easily the best steering in any truck with a live axle front end that we have ever experienced. Uh, it's actually better than the steering in our Duramax, which has an independent front end. Uh, it's about as good as the steering in our F-150, which also has an independent front end. The only truck that we own or that we have owned that steers better than this thing is our 2003 uh, Cummins 5.9 uh, rear wheel drive. It is not a, uh, a, a straight axle. It's got an independent front end as did all the rear drive uh, Cummins trucks of that era, meaning the third gen. And that truck steers like a sports car. That truck has the tightest steering. Uh, that, that, that truck steers better than most cars we've driven. Um, but this thing's not that far behind, which is extraordinary for a, a big heavy truck with a big heavy, uh, heavy duty front suspension rated to 5,600 pounds. Um, You'd think it would be sloppy as hell, but no, it's great. And we've discussed it, that, that little uh, motor that's in line with the uh, in line with the steering column, that electric motor, which operates the lane keeping and the lane centering systems, as well as the pro trailer backup assist. That, that, that little motor helps out a lot. Um, and who's the guy, JB Reviews, maybe? He's a YouTube guy who, uh, who has an F450 pickup that does not have that motor which you can see easily inside the left front fender. You can see like a shiny aluminum bracket that it's mounted on. Um, and because of that fact that he doesn't have that motor, the steering is just like a lot heavier at lower speeds and it's just kind of uh, a lot more numb, less responsive. So great, great truck. Very, very happy with it in, uh, in very many ways, in a whole lot of ways. Um, thanks, everyone. We will talk to you later. Have a great day.